Do you think product managers today are worse than they were years ago? On average, yes. Because I don't like happy customers. Because the opportunity to shift reality in the meeting is low. If there's a customer coming in rip shit about something or upset about the product, you have an opportunity to totally reframe the way they look at the world. If you're rocking it as a product manager, everybody thinks you suck. If sales loves you, engineering hates you. Because you're chasing deals and you're not thinking about the long-term future. If engineering loves you, sales hates you. Because you're just doing long-term stuff and you're never helping them close the deal. It's finding these impossible compromises. Why should people not go into product and product management? It might sound goofy, but... David, I am so excited for this. So I spoke to Ali years ago and I've heard many great things. So thank you so much for joining I'm, me today. I'm really excited to be here. Well, I want to start. How did you make your way into the world of product? It's, it's an interesting world. What was your entry point? You know, I'm a civil engineer by training, environmental, civil, and then I became a nuclear engineer. So it's not an obvious route, but I ended up um, at the startup, Plum Tree Software, and uh, first running QA, then running engineering. This guy that ran product, Phil Sofer, he was like a very good friend of mine. And every day I told him how he was doing his job wrong. I was the receiving end, building stuff, right? So I just told him this every day. And then one day he decided to move on to leave Plumtree. And he told the CEO, I had to run product to like get back at me, right? I did it. I didn't want to do it. You know, I was like, my job's too important doing engineering. You know, I can't give that up. But once I got into it, it was incredible. Like, <laughs> I, I've, got, I've got too many things to ask it. First, on the you know, helpful feedback to your boss uh, or to your <laughs> colleague, how did you do that in a productive way that wasn't? Um... I, mean, I was pretty young. I wasn't that productive. Like, <laughs> the the thing is, you need to build things that matter, right? Like, I the way I got into engineering is I was in QA, and there was a uh, there was this engineer. And his stuff had so many bugs. So I went into the source control system and I started to figure out the bugs, right? Um, and he locked me out of the source control system. I was like, what, what the hell, right? So I went to the CEO and I'm like, I don't know what to do here. I want this code to work. So he fired the guy and he told me to write it. Oh, wow. That's a, that's a way to respond. And, but it wasn't like malicious. He was a very like big hearted guy. But he just didn't want that kind of attitude in the company, you know? That is amazing. So why did you not want to take up that product role? You felt that your job in engineering was too important. Anything else? Again, like I got into this world through like weird ways. So I didn't understand the job. I felt that the engineering part was more important. But <laughs> I couldn't work on things that didn't have you know, clear customer value, weren't thought through. And the, and like Phil was amazing, amazing product manager. But it's easy to critique what you've never done. Sure. Right? So everything coming over the wall, I was like, these things don't make sense. And I was like, you have to define these things upstream or else we're going to go down dead ends. It's so interesting. You said about critiquing things you've never done. I'm constantly oscillating on the question of is naivety good or bad? It depends for me. I'm intrigued to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I, I think it's a superpower. You know, I think the less you know. So I'm again, I'm not a CS guy, but I ended up being like an architect at Plumtree Software and like running engineering at a bunch of places. And it's because I don't know what I don't know. Code is not complicated. You know, I don't I can't write it well, but I can understand it. You can look at it. It's just a logical system. I, I'm a systems engineer initially. So it's not hubris. It's just curiosity. What do you think you didn't know that you did or didn't do that was of real benefit? So like, you know, yeah, that's a, that's a puzzler right there. It's hard, but like, I didn't know actually that it would take years and years to build a following to the millions. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. If I had have done, I might have quit earlier. I, I thought it would come much sooner. And actually, it was just fun. And so I went along with it. Yeah. But yeah, the longevity yeah. of commitment required, I didn't anticipate. You figure out a way to solve a problem, right? And everybody thinks you're crazy, but then you just don't really have time to absorb that. And you just show, it's, what, there's a saying, some wise person said, if something's impossible, don't stop the people doing it. You know? Yeah. 
I, it was said much better than that, though. Oh, I'm sure it was said with a wonderful quote image <laughs> on Instagram. Yeah. No, I, I, I totally get you. You said there about kind of people thinking you're crazy when you solve a problem. One thing, and again, I'm glad that you said you didn't necessarily love getting the schedule before. Often customers don't love new products because it's a change from what they're used to, what they're expecting. Yeah, 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 yeah. How do you deal with that as a product? Yeah, so leader? I mean. It's a really tough It's funny, thing. I was, uh, we're having this world tour and I'm talking to a lot of customers and I don't like happy customers, you know, because the opportunity to shift reality in the meeting is low. They're like, you're great. I'm like, you're great. What do you talk about? But if there's a customer coming in rip shit about something or upset about the product or has a real business problem that they're stuck on, then you can almost just do a lame layup and make progress in the meeting. But you also have an opportunity to totally reframe the way they look at the world. And that's what's really exciting about working with people. People come in with a point of view about your product or their business. And the, like, I use the same methodology for like everything I do. Go in knowing nothing and then interrogate the person until you feel like you could do their job, right? And so you really understand like, if they say, I did this, this, and this, but you can't figure out how they got from here to here, you know, keep asking questions until you figure it out. Yeah. And then you get a picture of what they're trying to achieve. But then you're like, well, the why behind it. I mean, because they don't want to do all these steps. They just want to accomplish a job. Sure. And then you say, okay, well, they articulated a lot of pain in these steps. And you have a point of view that totally different from what they said. And then you kind of like try to tease the, the best imaginable out of them. So they say what you want them to say. How do you, that's really interesting. So they say what you want them to say. How do you actually do customer questioning well? I find a lot of people lead the witness. I mean, look, I'm, I'm a human, so I'm terrible at customer questioning because it's impossible not to lead the witness. It's really, really hard. So I, I oftentimes after, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I, I like to have other people that I know on, on calls. And then I ask them for like notes. One of the, the you know, Ollie's cultural values, but I, I've kind of internalized it even, you know, pre, pre data bricks is truth seeking. Like you want to get at the truth. You don't want to, you know, there's all the biases, confirmation bias, blah, 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 blah. The problem is open-ended questions, oftentimes you can't get to where you want to go, right? So then it's just like open-ish questions that are kind of leading. You know, how would it feel if it happened this way instead? Rather than like, let me talk at you and show you a demo and this is how it should be. When do you listen to customers versus when do you stick to product plan, product roadmap, and actually the idea and the vision that you had? People like to talk about being customer obsessed. Yeah. But I think of there's the customer and then there's the collective customer. So you have to be collective customer obsessed. So you never want to overfit to a customer because then it'll be a tiny TAM, right? Yeah. So the customer as well, I never listen to them in terms of how the feature should work. But what they need to accomplish, you need, you know, suss out if that's a common need from your collective customer. Because if you're serving one customer, if you're obsessing about one customer, but it's overfitting, you're screwing over the collective customer. Totally agree with you. Can I ask, there's a lot of feedback that one gets from customers. <laughs> um, when you map it out, it, it makes for an impossible job. How do you prioritize customer feedback and ideas, either that come from customer or come from team? How do you think about what to do next? It's funny. It's like uh, there are a lot of conflicting inputs. Mm -hmm. It's funny because a lot of people come to you wanting to go into product, you know? We'll get into that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And as you know, I tried to dissuade them. But basically, if you're rocking it as a product manager, everybody thinks you suck. Think about it. Okay, your stakeholders are there's customers, there's field, there's engineering, there's business finance, right? If sales loves you, engineering hates you because you're chasing deals and you're not thinking about the long-term future. If engineering loves you, sales hates you because you're just doing long-term stuff and you're never helping them close a the deal. Everybody around you and because they haven't done the job. Like me, when I, I was talking to Phil Sofer, everybody thinks they can do their job better, your job better than you. Like literally, people come to me and they're like, 
I could do your job better than you. Like from all functions, because they're so frustrated with the 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 path you have to take in order to to you know juggle all the different constraints. Why should people not go into product and product management? I mean, it might sound goofy, but have you ever read Letters to a Young Poet by Rilke? I haven't. Okay. I read it when I was like much, much younger. The the argument is don't write unless you have to. Because it's miserable, right? So people often think I want to be a product manager. I'm the CEO of the product. I'm the GM. I call the shots. I can tell people what to do. I can create something. I can be, you know, Johnny Ive. I can create this beautiful thing and everybody will build it and customers will love it. But that's not what the job is, right? It's finding these impossible compromises. What do you say the job of a product manager is then? For people listening going, no, I, I do want to be a PM actually. What is, what is the real job of a PM? Because I hear it's the CEO of the product, which sounds sexy. <laughs> it's bullshit. Yeah, it's sexy, though, isn't it? Like, okay, cool. It's, uh, <sighs> it's finding a way to make baby steps towards the vision while staying alive, basically. So the biggest misconception is actually the glorification of being the CEO. Yeah, and the fact that you have, like, unadulterated agency, you know? So if I'm talking to someone that wants to move from another function into product, um, the main thing I try to figure out is, are they doing product now? If you're an engineer and you're not involved in the PRDs and, and like even let's say you're in the field, right? You're a sales engineer. You're harping on engineering and product all the time to fix the shit your customers need until you see it working the way you want and then you're doing product management, right? But if you can live as a sales engineer or an engineer without doing that, if you can take the spec and build it, Without fighting, you can never be a pro so. If 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 you cannot not product manage, then you should be a product manager. <laughs> I, I totally agree. So you like people who aren't product managers already? Because I you know I speak to and I you know, sit on many boards and everyone's like, oh, we want someone who's been a PM for three to four years. They've probably worked at Google or Facebook <laughs> oh, or <shit. laughs> and and that is their spec. So you like people who are fresh to product management. They might not have had the title, but have they done it? How do you tease that out in an interview? You ask them where their biggest impact was, right? And if it has nothing to do with product, <laughs> you know, if it's like uh, calming down an angry customer, but it has nothing to do with the value, the you know, so you just tease it out and then interrogate from there. With interrogation, you get data, sometimes uh, helpful, sometimes less helpful. Um, you said before about being a data-driven product manager. Yeah. Before we d dive into kind of whether it's good or bad, what does that actually mean, being a data-driven product manager? When I saw this, I was like, huh, what, what is that? So, you know, Databricks used to have this value called data-driven, um, where we wanted everybody to be data-driven. But it has a dark side because you can weaponize data, right? You can argue any point of view with any set of data if you're clever enough with numbers. Sure. Right? So we, we modified that to be truth-seeking because the point of being data-driven was to be truth-seeking. But truth-seeking defangs the dark side of data-driven. Sure. Right? So let's say you're going to build a product. You want to like ship early, ship often. But how can you figure out the early signal if it's not revenue-based because maybe you're not charging it? of whether or not it's working, right? And you come up with a KPI and you can set goals and stuff like that and you track that. And we could talk about that for days, you know, like input metrics versus output metrics and things like that. As soon as you start like reporting on it, it becomes a thing, it becomes the goal. The data in your progress serves one purpose, one purpose only, which is to figure out your blind spots and where to ask questions. The goal is not hitting your target. The goal is seeing where you're varying or going way above your target, why? And then you can dig in and figure out if you need to course correct or not. A lot of times the right thing to do is change the target. The target was wrong. Like you came up with a target when you had a point of view and hypotheses before you shipped. How and then you disprove those and adjust the target. How often should you adjust the target? Well, I mean, that's another funny like, thing. And then a daily reveal of like, is this even the right metric here? Or how, how does that? If you're a startup of one, then continuously, right? You're continuously doing the loop of hypothesis, validation, no, I'm wrong, I'm an idiot, got to change. When you're a company of 6,000 people, you got to be very careful, right? They, you know, there's a lot of grumpiness to do it more frequently than annually, just because it's hard to, you know, a lot of people 
have built up flywheels that are organizationally complex to hit the goal. If it's existential, like why would you wait? Why would you do something stupid for six months? Because you have annual goals. I, I, I totally agree. It's speed everything. Everyone's like, the only thing that matters is speed and velocity. You illustrated two very different uh, types of movement there. Yeah, one yeah, yeah. Is speed everything or actually do people overemphasize the importance of speed? I mean, speed of what? Like speed of learning is everything. But that doesn't mean shipping. That doesn't mean, you know, people talk about one-way doors, two-way doors, type one, type two decisions and all this stuff. Like the key is maximizing your learning curve. And there's so many clever ways to do that. And a lot of it feels slow. You want to know why you are doing the next step, you know, before you do it. But then sometimes you can't figure it out that way and you just need to try. And that's when, you know, ship things that you might throw away and do it, you know, don't scale prematurely, don't over-architect it, get the learning in. And so why is most data-driven product management done badly? Because they get the, they let the data be the thing. Do you not think that they use data as a crutch to kind of lean on because they don't actually know? It, it, it's nice when you- I, I think that's it. it. Because here's the thing, I'm just as bad at this as everyone else. Like I have these dashboards. I build a lot of dashboards of a lot of metrics. And if there's something I don't understand, I like do data science until I figure it out. Um, and then I look at these all the time. Like this morning I got up, I looked at some dashboards. Am I gonna do anything with that? No, it's a fucking waste of time. But it hits that, it's like infinite scroll. I wanna see if the next bar is green or not. I have like this dashboard where if it's a record day for any subsegment, like a record Tuesday, because you know, there's obviously the big, the, the, the curve on the week, it's green. And I call it record book for all these different parts of our product. I look at every day, I get, it's green, it's green. We're rocking it. But like, I'm not gonna do anything with that. So it's a waste of time. And think about the time people spend. A lot of times you don't have a good telemetry in place. You don't have good BI systems. So there's humans spending time counting shit to put the number in, to send out the email with all the numbers so that people see it. And is that adding value? That's the problem. The human energy waste that goes in to data-driven product management when it's not becoming actionable. And so that's the difference. The difference between useful metric observation and unhelpful metric observation is actionable takeaways. Yeah, yeah. And making sure the thing you're measuring is not gameable and aligned to your vision. Can I ask, what would be your example then? Because I really struggle with this. You know, if you think about, you know, say me as an investor, you know, with our team, we can say, hey, number of companies met. It's about meeting as many companies as yeah. possible. You could game that and just make yeah, yeah. 40 shit companies. No, exactly. That's like top of funnel metrics. Yeah, I can make the top of funnel as big as you want. But everything's gameable. Like, can you give me an example of something that I couldn't game? Again, everything's gameable. No, I can't. <laughs> but, but things like uh, active users, like daily, weekly, et cetera, depending on you know, enterprise or consumer, time is so precious. If people are spending time in your product, there's value there. Now, it might be never uh, accretable to revenue value, right? You, it, to measure, that's a business model question. But you're building something that has value to someone if someone's using it. Mm -hmm. So those things are hard to game. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you there. I, I, like if you knew, like for this show, there's a number of subscribers. It's a little van. It's important. It shows no, us no, distraction. But bit. then like... If I could get percent of listeners that listen to more than 80% of the show, that would be much more usable yeah, yeah. and understanding. Or that then talk about it in a bar. Oh, yeah. That, that would be yeah, fantastic. but then how do you get that? So that's uh, that's a trick. I'm hoping trick. Jeff Bezos comes out with a device that invades <laughs> your your bar as well as your home. Yeah. <laughs> you ask, what do you think of the state of product management today? As you said, it's become the hot job for everyone. You know, it's funny. I have a kid, freshman in college now, and I just pay attention more to what's going on in college. And like, there's people hire consultancies because it's a top school of people in college to advise their companies. It's like a racket. I mean, there's like a, a name which then employs a bunch of college kids to do the consulting, you know? But you go to chat GPT, <laughs> fastest <laughs> growing leisure activities. <laughs> yeah, but it's like most people don't have like the hunger and the curiosity to keep going because it's a, it's a thankless job in a lot of ways. You think you're going to be the rock star, you're the roadie. 
you know? So you need a like stick to itiveness, whatever that weird word is, um, to be in product. But the people that have shown demonstrated impact, you know then that, well, if it was them, and that's a lot of the interrogation when you're, you know, hiring people, then they, they understand the mechanics of the job. If you were at Google during the aughts or, you know, you think it was because of you. It of wasn't course. because of you, you know? So how they accomplish extraordinary things at companies that aren't ramping. That's what I find that's unbelievable, which is how many people are at great companies with insane product market fit. But actually, they're really not very good. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, and it's just like, well, you know, search so at Google. Because it's confirmation of... bias. Like you think you're like, you ship a feature and it grows. Well, because the button's on the page and everybody's there, you know? But do you think product managers today are worse than they were years ago? I have no idea. I have no idea. Like, I think that on average, yes, because there's so many of them. When companies scale super fast, they have to build big teams fast. And it's just hard to sustain that, you know? Do you worry about that today? You mentioned the 6,000 people, uh, amazing people in, within Databricks, but do you worry that with the 6,000, you just can't move as fast and we have this incumbency challenge. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's just a different challenge at every stage. And, uh, you know, you've talked to Ali a bunch. That's what keeps him awake at night is the innovation factor. Now, objectively, we seem to be accelerating, which is a little, uh, you know, crazy to think about. I use the product constantly. Like, I, that's the only way I can understand it, you know. But I can't keep up with everything now. But again, we're, you know, a thousand engineers and, you know more than 100 people in product, so. But I think the it's hard to do, it's a different game at every stage of company. And you mentioned you can't keep up with everything. I think one thing that was really interesting when I spoke to so many of your friends and colleagues was the optimism that you bring to every product and product release. How do you think about that balance between optimism and also hesitant cautiousness with new products? Some said it was a weakness, some said it was a strength. Yeah, 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 no, I know. It's a... <laughs> Let's talk about I mean, you know venture, you know startups, product. Um, why, why? Why do something? Why do anything? Like, well, for, for us, is ma upside maximization. If, if it was... Yeah, it but could... I'm saying the, the person, the, the founder, yeah. why are they doing it? They're doing it probably because they're the kind of person that, that has a problem with authority and can't have a boss. One of our customers, like Zipline, they... they 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 use drone they launch drones to deliver medical like life saving things to remote villages that wasn't possible before, it's magic. Yeah. You know, the first time you called an Uber, it was like pretty insane. Pretty insane. You realize something could be made a ton easier, right? But then but then you have to you you're starting a company. You need to enroll someone in that vision, and you need to bring them along. Because you want a co-founder, you want to hire the first engineer or something like that. So you need to get them to believe or else they're not going to go through the shit show to try to get there. And I think, I think you will things into existence. I think we do impossible things all the time because we just don't think they're impossible. But I think human ingenuity can like create impossible things. Because you just really, really want it to exist and you find a way. No, I, uh, I totally agree with you. And I think it goes back to the naivety element, which is you also don't know that they're impossible. Yeah, when yeah. When you embark on them, we don't know it will take that long. Yeah, and so whether you're talking to engineers, engineers have to believe, right? Otherwise, they're just not going to have the same velocity. Do engineers believe? Because often engineers are held as like the cynical ones. Like, oh, they always say no to everything. Oh, cynical. Yeah, but, but, but so again, I call it brain massaging. It's really manipulation, um, <laughs> but so you arrived at the conclusion you have to do this through logic, right? Through a set of assumptions and stuff. And it's because you've basically taken the other possibilities and you've disproved them. And so you take the engineer through the same thing. The engineer wants to do this thing and you're like, Okay, it's great that you want to write your own API instead of using a standard. That's awesome. That sounds really, it would be like super efficient super elegant. It'll be great. So how are we going to get, you know, 10,000 developers to understand that? How are we going to get the whole ecosystem to adopt it? And you, all the things that you'd have to do if you don't, you, you know, if you invent some new proprietary shit. And then they're like, oh, that would suck, you know? And then they realize they don't want to do all the work you'd ask them to do to build this whole community. And they're like, 
We should we should use a standard. We should use a standard because then we don't have to do all that work. And I can work on fun stuff, you know? You need to take them down your mental travel because you're not, well, you might be stupid, but you probably have a point of view of why this is the right thing. And you, you need them to discover that in their own framework. When you change your destination or you realize that actually what you thought it would be, it's no longer, how do you communicate that effectively without being like a flimsy leader? Do you know what I mean? It's like, hey, I know <laughs> I really said hard. that we were doing this, but like, I was wrong. <laughs> it's so ingrained in being a human, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, and it ties to the thing about like willing something into existence. Like, I think, and this this will sound completely bananas to you, but I think like things you build, things you create that you love and are passionate about, there's a bit of you in it. Like there's a bit of your soul in the thing. Sure. So like you have imbued this thing with you, with yourself, and then someone's telling you to toss it out the window. You gotta be kidding me, you know? And so, so the, I think that when you're gonna change target and people have been working their ass off to build something meaningful to the old target, you just have to give it the morning cycle, you know? You have to be empathetic and human because you need them to come along with you on the ride. So, so what does that mean? It means, yeah, David, I understand the time and work you put into this, but because of X and Y, I've decided that actually we need to change our goal in this way. Yeah, because of this world we're in and these things we need to achieve, this, this creature you've created has an illness. <laughs> we have to have a funeral for this thing, but but you mourn in a funeral, you know, like you give it the space to say, yeah, this really sucks. If you don't put words to that, if you think they'll figure that out for themselves, you're lost. And then you have a churn like later on because they're like, management's bananas, you know? Should they care as much? And what I mean by that is like, I've had people on the show before say like, actually the unemotional product manager or the unemotional engineer is the best because actually they just think rationally is like, well, that didn't work. Okay, Ben. Yeah, I mean, that's great if you're doing something incremental. If you're like, let's grow revenue 10% <laughs> on a product that has product market fit. Yeah, you can be, you can have no emotion then. A lot of the job is not about specking the product and building the product. A lot of the job is about enrolling customers you talk to into what's possible. How can you do that without emotion? Do you have to do what you love? This was, I mean. Oh, that's funny. Um, I know it's a deep no. one, but I. I yeah. No, but you have to love what you do. Well, I went to the University of Pennsylvania um, because they told me when I was applying that I could get a dual degree in fine art and engineering. And then I got there and they're like, who told you that? <laughs> so I called my dad. I'm like, dad, I have this deep decision to make. Do I go into fine art or engineering? He's like, it's not a decision. You go into engineering. <laughs> So there's a lot of things I put on pause that I love, that I love. Now, I, you know, product management, creativity, you, you bring these things in, yeah. There's beauty in solving problems for humans. Yeah. And you, like, if you're not inspired by what's possible in what you're doing, then you should, you know, take a hike. You mentioned that fine art and engineering, a wonderful balance between art and science. And I'm always conflicted on how much product is art or science. I've had Gustav at Spotify say on the show, 99% science. Most people just like tentatively go 50-50, which always Okay, so like it gets back to this data-driven thing. Like I've known a lot of product managers that ship a product and don't observe how it's behaving in the wild through data. I think they're fucking insane. Like. You spent all this energy and willpower creating this thing and you're not obsessively watching exactly how it interacts with the world. That's crazy, right? It's so, a little bit like content, which is the biggest problem with content is people spend hours and hours and hours, especially at large companies, creating it, making everything look beautiful. Distribution, just press publish. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, I mean, we could... Uh, like, <laughs> putting something on your website is not marketing. Yeah. You got to get in the mind share of the person whose problem you're solving. They're never going to look at your website. Yeah. It's crazy. That that drives me nuts. It, yeah. That, the amount that, of venture firms that put together these glossy reports. This is reports. where I, I've, never, I've never run marketing. So I'm always telling them how they should do their job better. Because I've never, you know, it's the same thing as the flip as before. Do you worry they don't like you? 
Not in a bad way, but like... Well, here's the thing, like, and this is the the core of being a humanist, having empathy. I think everybody's a genius, maybe not at their job, but at something. Um, and they're trying to do the they're trying to do the best they can. If you lead with that kind of empathy and understanding, and try to enroll them in why it should be different, I'm just going for it. Do you think they can? Do you think they are? Like <laughs> they're doing the best they can. I don't know. I work my fucking ass off. Hold on. So so it's a good point. Doing the best you can. Like okay. So I'm having you know relationship stress. I didn't sleep well. I have a migraine. I uh, I just want to get through the day. That might be the best you can. Sure. You might be dialing it in at work because of some other meta, sure. right? That's fine. So people don't want to suck, you know, but they're dealing like everybody's world is infinite, you know. So with that mindset, if you are if you're talking to someone in marketing or sales or something, and you, you want to see different behavior, it's the same as talking to an engineer. You need to enroll them in why you the the missing opportunity. And just understand, be inquisitive and be open as to why don't we attack it this way? Wouldn't this be opening up a whole new thing? And when I do that, I learn a lot. And a lot of times it's like resource constraints and, you know, CEO, you know, needs this, all these things, sales. It's just like me, you know, people thinking product manager is a God role when it's a, you know, service role. If you were to put a number on product being art or science, what would it be? Well, this is this is where it's unfair because I presume that the only way to interact with the world is to fully understand the functioning system you're in and then have intellectual rigor and observation of data behind it. So I just assume that that's how brains work, but not, but not everybody's brain works that way. So if you assume that that's just free, then it's 90% art. If that's not a, a natural inclination of people, then it's probably a lot more of that being done purposefully. Have you always felt like that? Often what I see with product leaders is they tend to find that science leads the way in their early product leadership. That's, that, I, was, I was just gonna go there. Like I have created so many detailed frameworks, you know? And it's basically like I have mathematical proof that this is what we should do. Yeah. I refer to things with the wrong names all the time because of my like short-term memory. And the there's something like the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. It's an economic theory. And the, the gist of it is, the more detail you see, the more correct you think something is. Huh. You can have this incredible financial model. Like, you know, people do financial models in spreadsheets all the time. You can have like a very simple model, or you can have one billions of pages. And you, you're like, they put so much work into that. They're really good. But it's bullshit. A lot of it is using your collective experience, and there's a lot of science and math in that, to find holes in the strategy rather than like, because humans are not um, mathematically definable and products are for humans. So over rigor is just waste in the system, I think. How do you then imbue that in the team? How do you ensure that they don't put together you know, a 50 sheet Oh, yes. Like anybody listening to this yeah. that's worked for me thinks I'm totally full of shit now, <laughs> right? Because I ask, we ask people to do all tons of shit, and they're like, "This is meaningless," you know. But do you justify them? Do you say, "Well, no, it is actually valuable, and it's valuable for these three reasons"? Would you say, "Listen, I asked you to do it"? <laughs> no, I, I always want to get to the why. Like, let's talk about people on your team. Or people, you know, in a close adjacent team. Your team love you, despite what you just said. I mean. Well, I think that's because of the human connection. I am maddening to work for. I'm maddening because, like I said, I need to understand the system, right? So if there's something that's done that I don't understand, I'm picking it apart and asking a million questions because until I get the system, I might give wrong advice, right? But that seems like, and oftentimes is a little micromanaging. So I'm maddening, but I think I connect with people on a human level, so they respect the intent of my maddeningness. When you say, let's talk about the team, what have been your biggest lessons in terms of what it takes to build fucking amazing product teams? <laughs> it's hard. It's really hard. One of my biggest lessons on like leadership and management is actually that it's my job to know how each person internalizes feedback 
And actually, I was always yeah. like truth seeking. Well, I'm going to be direct. Yeah. And then some people actually need a little bit more hand holding, a little bit more love and nurturing. Yeah. yeah. And actually, you have to tailor the leader that you are to the employees that you have. Totally. Like every one on one I have is fundamentally different. Yeah. But that's because people like choose your style and you stick. With yeah, it. and that's but that gets to. I mean, you have empathy, EQ, and human understanding, and to enable you to do that. And that's really key in a leader. I think a lot of leaders are formulaic. Hmm. And I think the people follow people that see them. When I'm in a room and I'm frustrated, if I feel like I'm not kind of in the core of the conversation, but I have a point of view that I think they need to hear, like I just want to feel seen. Because if, I, if I'm not seen, I feel ignored, hmm. you know? When you give people feedback, you need to get their feedback on your feedback because, you know, you might not give them any space to talk about the why or, you know, what they're going through. That doesn't mean not to be resolute on the feedback. Like, I need you to do this. You know, if they look ashen and they, you know, they're like stressed out, figure out why. It's your job to figure out why because otherwise you've lost them. Do you know when you've lost them? I'm overly confident in this topic. So sometimes you do, sometimes it's clear, right? But I, I generally have this uh, unspoken or sometimes spoken contract with people that work for me. If you're going to leave the company, I'm going to help you find the best job imaginable. But first I'm going to figure out if you're running away or running towards. Like if you're running away from the company because something's broken, I want to fix it. If you're running towards an unimaginable opportunity, I'm going to guarantee you get it if I can. But then some people, don't trust me, you know? A lot of people tell me six months, nine months before they're gonna leave. And I help them get a kick-ass job. But some people don't trust me and tell me, oh, I've already accepted this offer from blah, blah, blah. I'm like, what did I do wrong? Did you make that offer clear enough? Do you say to everyone, listen, if there is ever a time when you are tempted to leave, just let me know. We can talk about it. I won't dissuade you. So I do that with my immediate staff, yeah. but often, you know, oftentimes there's layers in an organization and, you know, not everybody knows you that well. Yeah. But I feel, because I feel strong connections with people, I feel that they should know me that well. Like, don't you know me? Don't you get that I wouldn't like walk you out of the building in, in like anger? Don't no, because most people actually are different to how they present. Yeah. Which is one thing. And then it's not what you say, it's not what you do, it's how you make people feel. I know, exactly, exactly. And so, like, for example... Um, and the challenge is, if they're a manager removed from you, they may not be made to feel the way that you would want them to no, feel. No, exactly. And when I come into meetings, in my maddening way, you know, there's like, you know, the term like seagull management? Yeah. Like you swoop in and shit over everything, then fly away. Oh, I haven't heard of that. <laughs> no. I just heard of like the bird's eye overview that you just like peer down. Oh, no, no, no. You sweep in like, shit. Someone like categorized a bunch of animals and like, so I asked people that know me, like, was I too seagull in that meeting? And sometimes to my directs, it's fine. But then a new product manager that doesn't know me is like, why is this? SVP giving me shit about all this stuff. Do you worry that you become a cynic over time? I worry about this because I'm a little bit of a seagull. I, I, I have to be on top of like yeah. everything. But I do. Come down. <laughs> it's the fifth year of time I've seen kind of a BI tool for SMBs. Piece of shit. Next. And like you can't lose the optimism in venture and you can't lose the optimism in product. Yeah. Do you worry about becoming cynical with time? I kind of embrace becoming cynical with time because, I mean, we talked about one of my weaknesses is I'm too optimistic. Um, and I think that's unlocked incredible things in my life, incredible things. But it gets back to if you haven't enrolled people in the vision, oftentimes you can't achieve the vision and then it falls apart and then they're like, why were you such an idiot for being so optimistic? I'm like, well, if you believed we would have gotten there. It's
and SMB. Suddenly you're going after the practitioner and the business person. You try to be all things to all people and it's just way, way, way premature. And then you're nothing to anyone. You could choose the wrong narrow focus and implode, you know? So th that's the balance. I, I totally, I think the one thing that I also see is like slowly they open up the aperture of the available customer. Yeah. And so it used to be like BI analysts in SMBs. Yeah. And then it's like, well, BI analysts. And then it's like, just analysts. And it's suddenly like a freemium tool for everyone. Then it's a prosumer. Yeah. Because they get nervous as time goes on that traction won't happen, but you yeah. loosen your product marketing tightness yeah, yeah, with yeah. every expansion. What's that new like... The diabetes drug that everybody's losing oh, weight on. Ozempic. Yeah. So yeah. I read this article and someone was concerned that it'll be the collapse of society. Okay. So th these drugs not only That's quite a jump. <laughs> curb appetite, they curb other addictive things. So they're good for people. And again, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just reading this article. Um, they're good for people that have a gambling problem. But then someone looked at the data and this power users are the the thing that makes the revenue for all companies, basically. Like there's people that, I don't know if you have Chipotle here, but say a fast food that eat it every meal. I go once a year. So the company makes a lot more revenue from these people. And if you take away the addictive tendencies of the super users, no one will make profits in any sector of any business anymore because the 80-20 rule means you're going to lose 80%. Which is kind of a obviously that's 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 crazy, but it gets to the same in gaming, obviously. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, yeah so that the whole world's gonna collapse. <laughs> but the the you need your fanatic users. If your product becomes everything to everyone, you lose the fanatics. But your fanatics are the ones that talk about it in bars, bring their friends in, have the viral coefficients and stuff. But they're also the ones that push you to do unimaginable things to really break through barriers that can open up their, you know, power. I had Scott, uh, founder of Atlassian on the show. And yeah, I watched, talked, I watched that. Yeah, we talked about Jira and like, you know, bluntly, it can be quite hard for people to drop into. And my question to you is like, <laughs> how do you build for fanatics to retain them, to inspire their love even further, but also not make it holy shit yeah. <laughs> for someone to drop in on day one? It's hard. It's hard. Like. You need to use your product every day and you're not going to always be the persona it's for, but you need to at least have an appreciation for what that persona goes through. Products become complicated over time. You add a feature for one person, it might be another click for another person. And so, you know, there's lots, you know, again, you could leverage data to make sure you're not destroying engagement or the, the, the time to complete a task isn't ballooning and stuff like that. But I think that's where the art is. Like you really, it gets down to the human connection. Is simple always better in product? <laughs> simple is like the dumbest word. You know, it's like... Yeah, what a shit question, Harry. <laughs> what a shit <laughs> No, but like, what the hell does it mean? <laughs> well, I mean, a fewer, so fewer options, fewer, uh, fewer buttons, um, fewer color schemes. Like, simple, as, as small a option base as possible, I would say. So, so, I mean, clearly, is it always better? No. <laughs> if it's possible to still give the superpowers to the person you're giving superpowers, but you can't dilute their superpowers. So when I came into to Databricks, uh, I started using the product and I was like, good Lord, you know, I, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a developer. I mean, I've done it. I'm not good at it. Um, good Lord. <laughs> and I, uh, I was like, there were all these things that I saw as, you know, broken edges to the product. And I thought it was really important that we fix them. But most of the things I wanted to focus on didn't matter at all. Didn't matter at all. It's like the speed of execution mattered. Auto completing in code mattered. Consistent gutter width on the UI. Nobody gave a shit. But it hurt my eyes to see it, you know. So because different things matter to the developer wanting to be in the flow of their work than the goofy product manager that joins a company that's like, eh, the UI is not pretty, you know? I didn't really think the gutter was the most important thing. You know, I had a little more <laughs> intuition than that. But it's not clear what simple means. You know, simple doesn't mean for a developer um, removing optionality, unless it does. 
And that's where it gets complicated. Like you don't want to give people five ways to do things. If you can give people one way to do things, that's great if they can still do the thing that they need to do that they're using the product for, which oftentimes, you know, like I remember, so I've been using it last year for a while. In fact, we, we, we talked to them. I was at this company, Plum Tree. Um, Jay, who ended up, Jay Simons, I don't know if you've talked to him. Yeah, yeah, of course, I was mashing him last night actually about the show. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's, he's an old friend. Oh, wow, and, uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I should have uh, sent you his name, but he has plenty of stories. Um, but we, I don't even know if this is, we're allowed to talk about this, but we tried to acquire Atlassian back in like 98 or something. We thought we should get them cheap. They're a little dinky company, but they had a plan, you know? And they're like, pound sand, there's no way. But we're like, it's just a Jira. Then there's like this wiki confluence thing, you know? But then in 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 that product early on, you could do a lot with uh, like Markdown and stuff like that, you know? Uh, you can still do those things. But they moved a lot of those things to a like clickable text editor. And a lot of the stuff you could do when you like could script it all disappeared. And like, I was furious. I was like, these people are jokers. Cause like, I want to do all these things. Now all these things, there's no button for it. And it's a lot harder. Now that was the right choice because it radically opened up the TAM, right? There are a lot less people like me. You know, you need to go into that acknowledging that you're going to get rid of some people. Are those people you're getting rid of key to your vision? For Databricks, the developers are, we, developers have to love us, right? Because they're going to be the ones influencing the decision that the CFO makes. I'm fascinated. You said there about kind of the different types of feedback that different segments of customers will give you. Yeah. Product reviews that, you know, I'm not in product, obviously. They're kind of hailed as this kind of black box. How often do you do product reviews? Who's invited? Who sets the agenda? Can you just walk <laughs> me through it? Like, well, like, okay. So it's very different from like a brand new thing. So a brand new feature, brand new product. In short, there's like, it's like fractal. So I use a product all the time. I'm reviewing the product when I'm using it, like continuously. And so getting into like the preview, we have this dog food system and stuff like that. That's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, asynchronous product review. But then, you know, in the classic scrum sprint methodology, you, you demo every Friday, you know, you want the core group to be seeing things as it's being built because you can't waste time. And if it's going the wrong direction, you need to know soon, yep. right? But then you should have like continuous product reviews for the core team and then, you know, monthly or quarterly for management. But the danger, the danger is like the seagull management, like mm -hmm. everybody- How do you bring them along enough in the vision in yeah, real time? And so like, let's take Databricks. So when I got there, a lot of founders, they're all ridiculously smart. They're all operating in the company and uh, you want to- include them in your early thinking because they have so much context, so much wisdom, so much context. But then there's also the danger, you know, if you have a handful of founders, uh, they might not all have the same opinion about the button placement. And so that can be very wasteful to like do cycles on exactly how something should look with a lot of people. The intent and the context they bring to it is, is, is super critical. For example, you know, developers need things fast. You know, they should have few clicks. Everything should be keyboard driven and stuff like that. So the the danger is the more people in the room, the worse it is. In a bigger company, you, you know, people in the management chain all feel like they need to be in the room and there might be multiple levels there. And then it's just a ceremony. Like more than six people, what do you think? If you're going to try to make a decision, how many people would you have in the room? Like, it's got to be less than 10, probably more than four. I, I, I say four to six. It's like venture partnerships. Yeah, yeah, a lot of time, yeah, but yeah. four to six is really yeah. where you get the optimal decision making, I think. But then if you have 20 people, okay. it's a ceremony. I, I totally agree. Does remote or work from home change that in some way where people can be on mute, people can listen in, you don't feel their presence? Does that open up the aperture or change anything? Yeah. Because you dilute the clarity and the intensity of what you say, the more people are in the room, you know? Like even simple as like being glib, you know, using curse words and things like that. You feel uncomfortable because like you Which want to get to the truth. actually can be quite important. It can emphasize pain. It can emphasize, yeah. you know, if I say actually it's frustrating versus it's a fucking nightmare. Yeah. It's a big difference. Because that, that takes maybe four seconds to say it politely takes 10 seconds. Yeah. 
like if we work together a lot, we use the we we have the same lexicon, right? We can be efficient, high bandwidth. If you get ten people in the room, though, oftentimes it'll be it'll be like damaging. We'll say something, we'll understand each other, they'll interpret it differently, and they'll report the news to other people that's wrong. I, I totally agree with you in terms of the news reporting. How do you deal with that in terms of documentation of decisions made, action items, to ensure <laughs> that that communication downstream is efficient? Yeah, it's so important, and everybody's terrible. I'm terrible at it. Um, I like to be partnered with uh, kind of a you know a, a program management type person because I'm just useless. I'm not fastidious, you know. So I'll take notes. I want notes to be sent out, and oftentimes I'll just like if I join a meeting, and there's no document link to take notes for the meeting, I go apoplectic. And then I'll create one, and I'll write really bad notes, and then I'll forget to send them out. But I'll invite other people to, and then they'll send them out. So, like, I really believe in the importance of that. I'm kind of shit at it personally, but it's so important because, like, you know, at any company of any size, any venture of any size, you know, people do stupid shit, sure. right? Um, but if we get back to they're doing the best they can, so why would they do stupid shit? Well, if someone does stupid shit on my team. It's, I didn't give them the context because they're smart people. I hire smart people. So if they're doing something dumbass, it's because I failed to give them the context and the framework to understand why it's dumbass. When you review that, why have you in the past failed to give them the context? You're too busy. You haven't done it Well, the other thing is like, I need to understand the system of something before I give advice on it. So I like dig in hard. I assume everybody's brain works like mine. I know they don't, you know, and like every one on one is different. But um, my, I have a, a foible of, of, of thinking people think like me. So I assume a lot is self evident. You know, I assume the things that I find self evident, you find self evident because it's self evident. But that's the luxury of me being in a bunch of meetings you're not in. Sure. So it's self evident. So, and the I, background that you have, the education. Yeah, yeah, you have. yeah. So, like, it's not clear to me what is in someone else's brain. And I, I misread that a lot. Uh, you mentioned that you hire obviously very smart people. I think the hiring process is a very challenging one. Yeah. Always. Um, how do you structure the hiring process for new additions to your product teams? In terms of the structure, is there a... So the first, first, the first conversation I have with someone, it's the same as a customer interview or, or talking to someone in another function to move into product. So I want to understand impact you've had. And then you'll say something. And until I think I could do it, I keep asking questions. But you do that until you find someone's floor, right? So I have an engineering background, or at least a civil engineering background. I can decompose systems, you know? Um, and a lot of product managers don't know how their shit works out, you know? Because Databricks are very tech. I, in some consumer companies, that might be okay. But in enterprise software, you got to know how the shit works. Because otherwise, you'll give make bad decisions because you won't understand the dependencies, right? We talked about how, you know, someone that was at Google during the aughts, whatever they did, the numbers went up, you know? Um, but was it causal is the question. So trying to understand how they dealt with a difficult situation, is it other people's fault? Do they take responsibility? How did they get out of it? Were other people damaged in the way they got out of it? Is that you in know? the first conversation? Is that in the first meeting? Yeah, I, like I, I try to connect as a human um, in the first meeting, because first of all, what's my main goal of the first meeting? I want to fa you know, fast fail if they wouldn't be a fit, and I want them to want to talk to us again. Oftentimes, it's easy to forget the second part. Being deeply, deeply curious about what someone's done, they feel seen. And if you feel seen, you feel a connection, and you want to talk again. That's my hypothesis, or at least... People for whom that doesn't work, I just lose in the process. Okay, so we find actually that there's someone really interesting and we want to do a second meeting or a third meeting. How do we dig deeper on their technical skills? Is there case studies? Is that how do we understand ability greater? So I think that um, the it's great to find a low stakes way to do work together. The best way to figure out if someone's good to work with is to work with them. Yeah. And oftentimes that can just be, but then if you say, you know, give me advice on my product. 
that's a big lift for them. Yeah. You know? And also they don't have the context. If I right, just dropped right. into your product, you'd say, And uh, they could say something stupid and I haven't given them the context and I judge them for that. So if we take a problem from their domain and work sh- like change, change, uh, change part of the context, change a uh, constraint and see how they deal with it and talk through it, you're working with them. Well, yeah, but, well, the thing I find hard there, though, is that you then don't have the context and they've been working on it for three years. And so whatever they say, you'll be like, wow, that's smart. And it's like, well, no, you just know nothing. And they've been working on it for three years. Eh, I, that's true. That's definitely a failure mode. But, um, you know, it's powerful to know nothing because you ask questions that seem dumb, but it can kind of throw people off because they're not the questions they're expecting. And you see the internal consistency of what they're talking about. And again, how they're talking about it. If they're just taking credit for shit without the how, like it's really the meta. It could be anything. It could be talking about how, you know, civilizations on Mars operate. They don't exist. But, it, you know, it's like a great world building fiction book feels real, but it's all made up. But there's a lot of intellectual, you know, coherence in what they're talking about. So I think you can you can smell bullshit pretty easily, even in a domain you've never seen before. If you're just intellectually curious and you keep kind of digging until you understand it. It's like Toyota's five whys. Oh, why did you yeah, do that? Yeah, exactly. Oh, why, why exactly. Do do that? It's a five whys process, yeah. but dealing with humans. What's the biggest mistake you've made in hiring processes? People can be incredible, incredible in one company and a total failure in another company. I've worked with people who were like brilliant game changers. Um, Oftentimes they didn't show up first that that was obvious, but then they like accomplished amazing things. And then I brought them to interview at another company, convinced they'd be a game changer at the other company. Um, And then the panel was like, this person isn't a fit at all. And they they give me, you know, a bunch of reasons that are true. And it's just because different companies have different cultures and different needs. And like, like, let's say, you know, someone would be great. You know, they would. Um, But there's people that doubt in the process. If someone comes in and there's non-believers, confirmation bias is very real. So if you can't enroll the hiring committee to believe that this person's great, they're going to fail. How do so, you structure a hiring committee? Not too big. <laughs> but make making sure that you have you have to have people whose job it is to prove that the person's about hire. If I have people that work for me as the only people on the hiring committee and they know I really like a person, it'll color their view, right? So you have to have antagonists in the system, a small number, it should be cross-functional. You need to have someone technical. Well, in enterprise software, you need to have someone, you know, product, someone technical, and some naysayer as like the core three. And all three of them have to be deeply, deeply respected in the org. Hmm. And that's the hard part. What that the, you need their signal to matter. What are the first things to break down in scaling product talks? We have these hiring processes. We hire many people. You've been in very fast scaling product talks before. Yeah. What are the first things to break? Losing touch with the day-to-day of the individual contributor. Um, It's often to like, I don't know what people spend their time on intrinsically. There's things I assume I ask for something to be done by everybody in the org. And in my mind, it's just a tiny, tiny extra effort every week. But these things can pile up and be meaningless to the point where, you know, they're just running the machine and they're not doing the art, you know? They're doing the work, not the art. Yeah. Yeah. They're not they're not deeply truth seeking what really matters for the customer. They're filling out you How know, do you checklists. retain that at scale? Integrate them into customer support once a month? I hate the measure what people do, but um make sure they're talking to customers all the time. Like a third of their time should be talking to customers. A third of their time should be using the product and working with engineering. And a third of their time should be thinking probably, you know? But it never works out that way because usually 60% of their time is filling up bullshit. 
What is the most fictitious functions? I know that's a weird question, but like, is it engineering and sales where sales sell ahead of time and then say to engineering, I need this feature? Is it between products and engineering? Is it between products and sales? It's engineering and sales. Engineering and sales. Yeah. Why? When I came into to Databricks, um, it was bimodal, right? Engineers thought sales ran the company and were destroying it. And sales thought engineering ran the company and were destroying it. Nah, everybody loved each other. But the, the point was there was no real product muscle. I mean, Ali ran product, but then he became CEO and there was a gap. Engineers and sales have Don't opposite, opposite is a good yeah. word, sure. um, motivations, short term, long term. And so they're always going to think the company would be better if the other had less influence. A salesperson, like this is a customer that wants to give me $5 million. Are you on crack? Like, why aren't we building this feature to get the $5 million? Engineers, like, it would destroy the company because nobody else wants what that company, you know, it's the-, the You the want to work on this security thing over this new product that's going to get us guaranteed revenue? Seriously? Yeah. Is, yeah. Do you mediate that then as a product? I'm like the there? fixer or the mediator yeah. for a lot of these things. So, um, like, I always try to find a third way. The, people always uh, present- options that are myopic, you know? Like we don't do this and we lose the revenue or, or we, you know, we do it and it delays our strategy. And I'm like, no, I don't like either of those options. So you talk to the customer and you find out they don't even need the feature. Like it happens all the time. You're like, we could do this for you. We could do this for you, but wouldn't it be better if we did this for you and no, no, I really need this. But then you just tease it out. I'm like, but if we did this, this whole scope of work you have to do first half of next year would disappear. You know, like, so again, you talk to the customer, you diffuse the situation, you enroll them into what you really want to do. And then you make the, you know, salesperson realize you never needed the feature. Now, you don't, it doesn't always happen. And because I'm too optimistic, sometimes I like come up with a crazy third way that is just, it's, possible if everybody was inside my brain, but then coordinating all the pieces to do weird shit sometimes doesn't scale either. Possible if everyone was inside my brain. It's like reality distortion fields. What's the difference between good reality distortion and bad reality? Every great leader in startups, um, like you're, you're bending reality, you know? You're, you're, you're creating things that seem impossible. So. You have to enroll people in that. And once they're enrolled, if you think something's impossible, but you convince three friends, then the four of you think something's impossible, but the world, reality, thinks it's impossible. That's reality distortion. Mm -hmm. But you enroll people in it so they can hunker down and prove everybody wrong and accomplish it. As organizations grow and you know leaders have ego, um, you can believe yourself and not be truth seeking. And then you can do your company a lot of damage and you can do people a lot of, think about how many people that have been traumatized by startups, you know? It was kind of like, we wanna accomplish this by any means necessary because it's the right thing to do. And you start to see less and less what you're compromising to do that. And so if you get caught up in your own reality distortion field, like it might be impossible. So you've convinced all these people that something impossible is possible and they're going to waste a lot of, you know, their career chasing you on it because you're so convincing. That's when it gets, gets, you know, a dark side. What's the best relationship between a head of product or a CPO and a CEO? After every product role I do, when I'm seeking my next role, I want it to be anything but product. <laughs> And everyone's and then, like, product. And then you meet someone like, you know, Ali, you know, pulls back this curtain and you're like, holy shit, I want to be part of this. Let me do some product stuff. But the CEO is the CPO, right? So it gets back to, are you a rock star or are you a roadie? You're a roadie. It gets complicated because you want to do, you want to exercise your craft and do something that you know is the right thing to do. The CEO is driving the vision of the company and knows the right thing to do. And you can't be in their brain and they can't be in your brain. And you're both working really hard and really busy and probably don't talk that much. There's always this conflict between you're hearing that we need to do things that you don't understand the full context of. 
and it's frictive with what you know you need to do. But you don't have the bandwidth or the time to articulate what's in your brain to the CEO. How do you have great communication then? Again, it gets back to hiring, but high bandwidth and truth seeking, taking ego out of it. You know, how often do you speak to Ali? Uh, to Ali, very seldom. But it's generally, you know, messaging yeah. and uh, calls late at night. You know, random times of the week, um, day to day, because the key is um, to be simpatico enough. Like for example, for the second half of the year, I listed all the main objectives I had and the tide of the vision and what outcomes they drive. I get in his buy-in on that, and I just relentlessly, you know, go after those. Is oftentimes I I send a lot to him that I don't necessarily get responses on unless he disagrees. Yeah, you know. So like, there's a lot of delicate shit that goes on, and so I send to him probably you know a couple other leaders, founders, Adam or whoever, um, and then if I hear nothing, I just execute like mad. Final one before we do a quick fire. When you like review yourself as a product leader, what would you say you most need to improve on? Because I form this human connection with people, um, I underestimate the negative impact my words can have. What does that mean in reality that you hurt people more than you think? Yeah, I might be despondent about something unrelated to the topic at hand, and my body language conveys that and that's interpreted as disappointment in the topic at hand. How would you change that? <laughs> <laughs> Move on. Like being cognizant of it minimizes it and takes the edge off it, but it's just, you know, moving fast, trying or to Or is it communicating done. to them that actually this is just how I am and don't be disheartened or alarmed if X or Y happens? Yeah, I think that gets to like just being honest. You talked about how every one on one is different, right? Yeah. Like, just be direct and honest. Be vulnerable, and share you know what's going on, and then they'll assume best intent with how you communicate. Do you think leaders are vulnerable today? I think I think all the great ones are. Yeah, I agree. And then you get to a level where you're a politician. I see it with the shows where you get to we don't name names, but certain heights. And you suddenly then have to embrace being a politician. It's so funny, you like, I mean? like you know, I, I we both know Jay Simons well, right? Yeah. And he just talked about like there's the stage you get when an elevator ride is like heightened and consequential for how you interact with everybody in the elevator because of your role, and people want things from you, people want to feel seen by you, and it just. It like it's it gets crazy. The the way of words you can have, is yeah, hard. Yeah, and you can have a very brief interaction that's very asymmetric in how much it meant. Well, I think that's actually probably one of the hardest things, which is like, and it sounds awful, but if people, if you're a scholar at Atlassian or you're a market um, Salesforce, that is that, and this sounds I didn't mean ridiculous. That's the highlight of someone in state meeting you if yeah, they're in tech. Like, yeah, for sure, yeah, you're one of their heroes. Yeah. I'm sure. If you're a bit tired, haven't had your coffee in the morning, your wife just had a go at you, your husband just had a go at you, you're not like, oh, hi, David, hi. It, it, it can actually not be the best yeah, ever no, experience. Yeah, no, and that's, that's hard. And that's really fucking hard. And that's why sometimes it's like, so we're doing this conference, you know, so I gave a couple of keynotes yesterday, customer meetings for five hours, and then I go to dinner with like 50 customers. Are you kidding me? Like, it's so loud, you can't hear people. Bizarre accents, you know, like bizarre. Yeah. I mean, American accents are bizarre, but like you have to really focus, and you're like you're just done. You're like spent, you know, and like you just need quiet time. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna do a quick fire. All right. So, what should you focus on if you want to get promoted as a PM? Really, really know the customer, and really, really know the product know exactly how the product works and know exactly what the customers need in aggregate. What's your all-time favorite font? <laughs> DM Sans, because my initials. <laughs> Tell me, what would you say is the biggest mistake founders make when hiring product teams? Not being clear about the level of agency they'll have. Hmm. What does that mean? Meaning a founder CEO 
is going to be in the details of all the shit and that's good. And some people expect, you know, complete agency calling the shots as a product leader and they will fail. I think you've only worked with good founders. <laughs> and what I mean by that is quite often what I hear is like, oh my God. I mean, that's so far removed. Like they just kind of left me to all of my own abilities. Okay. 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 So the, uh, I was talking about good founders. Yeah. yeah. Um. So I've, you know, I've worked with a lot of people that were basically like the right thing for me to say was I've got it. And I tried that for the first six months at Databricks. And that's not what Ali wanted to hear. He didn't want me to go off and do something and then show him how awesome it was. You know, he wanted to be deeply involved and have the founders deeply involved in the sausage making because they had so much more context and I wouldn't go through, you know, wasted time that way. No, I totally get you. What one piece of advice would you give to someone starting a new role as a CPO, a product leader? There's a failure mode where you feel like you have to put together compre comprehensive frameworks that sales is, you know, given confidence by and like, just give yourself time. Do as little like changing the world of how the company works as possible in the first 90 days. Should you look for early easy wins? Um, yeah, but they shouldn't be vanity wins, you know? If the early wins are human more than technical, you'll uh, build the followership you need. No, I, I, I agree with that for sure. I see too many coming in and like, I'm going to change everything. And then it's like, <laughs> whoa, no, no, no. Uh, what are some most important skills to build early, early in your career and product? So when I was at Plumtree and, you know, Phil Sofer left and told John Koontz to make me run product, I met with John Koontz and he, he was at Adobe in the great days, you know, in product. He ran product for a lot of creative suite stuff. And I was like, John, I'll do this. I'll do this if you want me to do this. But I need you to be my mentor. I need you to teach me how to do products. I, I don't know what to do. And he's like, you can't teach it. <laughs> that's all he said. Thanks, John. That's, that's <laughs> super helpful, isn't it? <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, throw me in the deep end. Cheers, brother. Uh, you should do it. And uh, you can't teach it. No, no. Okay. Uh, you, you also, I think it's very difficult to teach parenting. Yeah. If you could cool yourself up the night before you had your first child, what would you say to yourself? Like, hold on to the wonder. What does that mean? I appreciate it. It's so that. easy. Like, so the first kid we had, urgency for them to like roll over. Urgent, like, they're going to walk. When are they going to walk? When are they going to like? Second kid, you want to delay walking as much as possible because then you have to chase them, you know? Just watching them. Like, you watch videos of them as babies now. And you're just like, it's just amazing. Every little thing they do is amazing. Like, Stop trying to shape them. Just, you know, get a front row seat. I love that. It's so true. So you're always like, ah, and then and they're going to school soon. And then and then suddenly it's like, oh my God. Yeah. They're gone. Or just first one went to college, you know? Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Does it get easier? Wait, parenting or yeah. product management? Um, my wife says management. bigger kids, bigger problems, you know? So it gets different. Um in a lot of ways, the so um, it's interesting. It, it ties into career, right? Because these things are a balance. I used to think when I left work to go home, I was being selfish until I had kids. And then I thought when I stay at work and don't go home, I'm being selfish. The clarity is easiest when they're young, you know, because it's clear what you, what, like spending time is good and, and what to do. How to navigate as they get older, how much do you try to, try to direct shape, how much you try to kind of respect and learn. I'm bad, I'm a bad disciplinarian, you know? It's like in sales and engineering, I try to find the third way. Like the kid is obstinate and you know, the rules are this. I try to find a compromise. Compromise isn't always good for kids. You know, you need to set boundaries. I don't know. Isn't that why you have a partner? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a very important. Go that. <laughs> you got to balance it. Yeah, that's, that's Listen, I agree very with useful. you, darling, but you should go and see your mother. <laughs> that's amazing. What recent company, final one, what recent company product strategy are you most impressed by? So I'd say like two for me, which is like Notion and Canva. When you look at what they've done in terms of opening up the aperture of templates, why did that happen 20 years earlier, though? That's what I can't figure out. It seems so self-evident, you know, now. When you asked the question, I was thinking more about business model, you know, because mm -hmm. I think that's where 
you know, disintermediating things and like there's a there's a business model innovation is by true that's where I get most excited happens. about yeah not yeah. on the craft of the product I really respect the craft of the product but the companies that I find most intriguing are ones that uh, you know have a very unusual insight into business model like the early days of a company like O Power you know they were using data to drive efficiency at power plants in the US because the power plants got paid by the government for reducing the demand of the energy. You know, so it's like multiple way it's very complicated to pull things off like that. But like like figuring out to to the the big problems of environmental transformation, um, energy efficiency, uh, you know, social and economic equity. You have to come up with really creative business models to to tackle those things. And I think those those are the fun ones to think about. David, listen, I've loved doing this. I'm so glad that you uh, didn't really read the schedule or spend much time on it because <laughs> we didn't really stick to it at all. But this has been such a joy. That was really fun, yeah. <laughs>